My name is Christine Sprunger, and I'm a, an assistant professor in the School of Environment and Natural Resources. Um, I'm a soil scientist and rhizosphere ecologist, and I think a lot about soil health and ecosystem services within agricultural systems. Uh, so my talk today is going to be a little bit different from what you've heard this morning. I'm not going to be talking about soil balancing, um, but rather I'm going to be talking about how management practices influence soil health in corn production. And so I'm sure you've all heard about soil health. It's kind of this new buzzword. Um, but the reason why it's getting so much attention is because it has a lot of importance at local and regional scales. Uh, at the local level, we know that you know, improvements in soil health are often correlated with greater agronomic performance, um, also greater ecosystem function. And we also know that from a soil health testing standpoint, there's a lot of uh, interest from farmers because they've seen over the years that traditional soil tests maybe aren't telling the full story. So perhaps they look at their soil organic matter value year after year. It's not budging even though they're implementing different sustainable management practices. And so we get a lot of enthusiasm about soil health testing because there are these indicators that perhaps um, focus on active carbon uh, that are more sensitive to management and can kind of pinpoint changes in your system you know, from a year-to-year -year basis rather than only seeing changes uh, every three years. And at the regional scale, there's kind of this pressure to link soil health to ecosystem services, so retaining nutrients in the soil and um, reducing uh, nitrate leaching and runoff into our waterways. So some of the soil health indicators that I'll talk about today um, are respiration, um, which a lot of people, I don't know if you're familiar with the Solvita test, it looks at a CO2 burst, um, it, uh, often correlates with a lot of microbial processes and microbial activity. Then we have active carbon, which is this pool of carbon that's available to microbes. Uh, sometimes people are a little bit confused with the difference between respiration and active carbon. We often think of respiration as a mineralization process, and active carbon is more of a stabilization process, so thinking about carbon sequestration and accumulating that soil organic matter. And then we have Soil protein, which uh, is an indicator of available nitrogen or the organically available pool of nitrogen in your soil. And just briefly, um, we often think about different sustainable management practices and we kind of know what practices increase soil organic matter and soil health. Um, you've heard that it's important to increase your organic matter inputs through applying manure or compost. <laughs> You've likely heard it's really important to reduce soil disturbance by having some type of conservation tillage. And we've all heard about the importance of cover crops and really extending that uh, ground cover throughout the year. Um, but there's a little bit of a disconnect with, you know, do these soil health promoting practices actually increase soil health? So that's what we're going to talk about today. And especially um, in organic corn production and also in uh, conventional systems, we know that there are these on-farm trade-offs, right? It's really easy to say, yeah, let's try to increase soil health by implementing these different management practices, but we also know that there are weed pressures, so there's this balancing act between, um, you know, managing your weeds and then also increasing soil health. And, you know, with these new soil health indicators that we've done quite a lot of work with at OSU, there's still a lot of really kind of basic questions. And so when we talk to farmers about soil health testing, a lot of times they'll just ask, you know, these numbers are exciting, they're new, but what's a good value for a given soil health indicator? I don't really know what this number means. Um, we'll also get questions about how do my soil health test values compare to others? Um, and then what crops should I grow in my rotation to improve soil health? So those are some of the questions that have motivated this work. And um, the way to kind of answer some of those questions is to build a strong soil health database. And we're not the first people to try and do this. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Cornell and their soil health testing program. 
Um, but this is a, a graphic from a recent publication out of Cornell where they developed distributions of soil health indicators. Um, unfortunately, they did not include Ohio in their study, so we felt like it was a good reason to continue some of this work in Ohio. Um, but really, they work to assess the extent to which various management practices influence soil health. And one thing that we really wanted to do was use more regionally relevant soil test extractants. So we wanted to use Malik 3 um, versus the modified Morgan. So some of the research questions uh, that I'll kind of talk through today are, first, how does soil type influence soil health indicator distributions? And two, what management practices most influence soil health and corn production across Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania? And so this was really an interdisciplinary research effort. Um, so you heard, if you were here the first, during the first talk, about the soil uh, survey that um, the social scientists conducted. So they were really interested in soil balancing and organic corn production. And we felt this was a good opportunity to try to get some soil health data from these farms. So what we did was, along with this long survey, we sent postcards that offered a free soil health test in exchange for filling out the survey. And uh, we actually got quite a bit of interest in uh, getting a free soil health test, as you can imagine. So once, once a farmer agreed to uh, a free soil health test, we sent instructions to the farmer, and we said, select an area that you want to sample and take 10 cores uh, down to a depth of 20 centimeters. And then they composited the sample, sent it into us, and then we sieved the soils um, and then analyzed them for chemical, physical, and biological properties. And then once we um, found out the, the different soil health indicators, we sent the farmers a comprehensive soil health test. And so along with the soil sample that the farmers sent to us, they also sent a management survey because we really wanted to get a handle on the different management practices that they were using. So this is just an example of uh, what kind of crops were grown in their rotation for four years. And this just shows that they had um, three years of hay and then corn. And then we also wanted to know about tillage. And so this is asking kind of two questions. First, the frequency of tillage passes, and then also the intensity. We wanted to know the different types of tillage that they were using on their farms. And just, this is uh, for state maps um, where we receive soil samples. So you can see, especially in Ohio, we got quite a bit of um, participation across the state. Um, Michigan and Pennsylvania as well. Indiana, we didn't get as much participation, but um, still that northern part, uh, we got uh, about six counties to participate. And then this is just an example of um, kind of the distribution and uh, different uh, management practices that we found that these, these farmers were using. So most farmers were applying some type of manure <laughs> Um, we had a total of 197 farms participate, and so of those, 92 said they were applying or in, incorporating some type of cover crop into their uh, rotation. And then a shocking amount, 148 farms, had some type of perennial present in the rotation. And um, I just want to uh, point direct you to this graph right here because we're going to talk a lot about the number of crops in the rotation. So you can see that um, it was most common for there just to be two or three crops in the rotation. When you get further out, you know that they're having you know, multiple different cover crops in their rotation, but that wasn't as common. And so here are some key distributions. Um, so thinking about the cation exchange capacity, we see the frequency um, there was quite a lot in that 5 to 10 range um, and 10 to 15. Um, so we kind of classify these soils as maybe a silt loam. 
Um, and then we can see that for the organic matter, um, you know, the mean is about 2.2%. Um, so, you know, 2.2% soil organic matter, when I say that, that means something to you, right? When I talk about um, the soil health distributions for these different uh, soil health indicators, you know, saying respiration is uh, 58.9 milligrams per kilogram of soil, that doesn't really mean anything to you. So part of that, part of this, the goal of this work is to build distribution. So when you get a soil health test and you see that you have um, 559 milligrams per kilogram of soil of poxy, you know that your poxy level is intermediate or better relative to other so samples of a similar soil type. So that's what we're trying to do is put some meaning to these kind of abstract soil health indicators. And in terms of the distribution for mineralizable carbon and that active carbon poxy in the middle, it's pretty evenly distributed. Um, the soil protein value is a little bit skewed. Um, most are found in that four to uh, eight range. And so now let's think about how do different management practices influence soil health and corn production. And so this is a graph looking at the importance of uh, crop diversity and soil health. So typically when we think of crop diversity, we think of that as being a positive influence on soil health. And we actually found the exact opposite. Um, when we see an increase in Crop, um, crops in a four-year rotation, we see slightly negative, um, we see a decline in, in soil health. And this was really puzzling to me at first because this is just like kind of um, not conventional wisdom, not what we learn in school, but we realized that there's another big story here, and that is the effect that crop rotation diversity has on tillage. So we actually see that when you have an increase in crops in your rotation, there's also an increased frequency in tillage, and that's likely the reason why we have a decline in soil health. But let's kind of use some more advanced statistics, right? We want to look beyond correlations and understand what's really driving soil health on these organic farms. So for the next series of graphs, what I'll show is um, subset regression. So all that means is we put all these different variables in one model, and we just ask the model to predict uh, which management practice was like the biggest predictor of these soil health variables. So we're just looking for the most important variable to predict soil health. So when we um, look at respiration, it was tillage and perenniality that were the top ranking predictors for respiration. And so we see that tillage um, is negatively correlated with uh, respiration, and it's significant. And then we also see that for perenniality, with there is a perennial present in a rotation, um, there actually is greater respiration um, with a perennial in the rotation, but it wasn't quite significant. But that's still, um, you know, an important trend to note. And then when, we thinking, when we're thinking about soil protein, so that organically available pool of nitrogen, tillage, again, was the top predictor. And again, we see that negative association with uh, soil protein. Also for soil protein was the type of cover crop. That was really important in terms of predicting soil protein. And here we see um, something quite surprising. We have um, greater uh, soil protein in the non-legume versus the legume cover crop, which is kind of counterintuitive because you typically incorporate legumes into your rotation to get an extra nitrogen credit. So what this is showing with this soil protein value is that perhaps it's not totally about 
um, the source of nitrogen, but it's also about nitrogen retention. So those roots that are in those non-legume cover crops are retaining nitrogen. And then um, for the active carbon, total number of crops in the rotation was actually the top-ranked predictor. Uh, and this shows that we had great, greater amounts of active carbon when there was um, three crops in the rotation. So that kind of seems to be the sweet spot for um, these organic corn production in terms of your, the uh, carbon value. So in summary, um, you know, organic farmers in the Great Lakes region are utilizing quite a wide range of management practices to maintain crop diversity. Um, but crop rotational diversity has quite a complex relationship with soil health indicators, um, likely due to increased tillage frequency. So what we saw was when we had an increase in crop rotational diversity, um, there is an increase in tillage and a decline in soil health. Um, but when we saw um, increased perennials in the rotation, there is a decrease in tillage and an increase in soil health. Uh, so, you know, when thinking about which um, types of crops to include in your rotation, it seems like at least in an organic corn production system, that perennial crop is really important. And then what, one really kind of positive outcome of this study is that this is an effective kind of stakeholder engagement um, uh, type of way to do research. So, you know, we had contact with over, you know, almost 200 farmers that were really interested in soil health. We would like to expand and maybe do, work with a subset of these farmers to do more in-depth um, field trials, maybe connect some of these soil health indicators to yield, um, but there, there's a lot of potential for, for further engagement. Um, and with that, I will just like to thank uh, the Soil Fertility Lab for running um, the soil health test, uh, Dr. Doug Jackson-Smith for helping with the management survey, the participating farmers, and then our funding sources. <laughs>